Hello everyone. Today we're going to have more of an easygoing video, just something simple for me to do while I record and edit some more, you know, more time consuming projects. And I thought it would be fun to go to this video, the character introduction video for the Spinosaurus, and go through it and talk about the characters, specifically introduce them in a way that's more personal than it would be just reading a wall of text about them. You know, again, just something really easy and simple for me to do while I... So I'll have some to upload while I record the more extensive and time-consuming projects. Sound good? Alright. So be before we do that, I I wanted to to first talk about where I actually got the idea for this book series in the first place. Well, one, it stems from my love of dinosaurs and just prehistoric life in general. <laughs> in fact, uh, I love anything dinosaurs. I even got these Dr. Pepper cans that have dinosaurs on them from Jurassic World. I didn't care for the movie, but I like the dinosaurs. <laughs> and also, it stemmed from another book I wrote but never released. I never even fully finished. I stopped before like the last two chapters were, were finished which was a zombie apocalypse book set in my hometown, actually, for a dash of authenticity. And a lot of the... And I actually plan to go back and finish that after I finish this story, but a lot of the characters, the plot, and even some of the props got directly carried over. At my zombie apocalypse book, which was called After They Awoke, and if I, whenever I go back to it, that's what it's still going to be called, it was a direct precursor. Like I said, a lot of the characters came over, their names were changed, but a lot of names were even, from that book, were even given to characters in this one. And props, the character Nick, from who, if you've listened to the audio narrations, you know who that is. Uh, he has a pistol, which uh, I specifically mentioned, and that main character in After They Woke had one just like it. And a lot of the plot lines also kind of carried over about different groups and villains and stuff. So one of the characters who we'll meet in this one, Carl Newton, actually his direct precursor was Zaref Blake Archer from After They Awoke. Though the character has since changed and Blake was way more of a depraved lunatic. And Carl's more of a cold calculating guy. So, but anyway... Uh, I'm gonna we're, we're gonna get right to it. So I'm gonna quit rambling. So that's just a little bit of the kind of how this story came to be. And now let's get to me just discussing the characters and just things that I couldn't quite convey in just a wall of text video. All right, sound good? Okay, let's get to it. Right, so first off is Spino, the Spinosaurus that the series is named after. He's basically the mascot of the whole thing, and here's a picture of him drawn by a friend of mine. Now, I'm going to assume that you have already watched the character introduction video and read this wall of text. If you haven't, uh, feel free to pause and do it. So, Spino is... As this says, he's as loyal as the day is long, and he is one of, if not the very first, um, dinosaurs resurrected by the anomaly. Now, I feel like I do need to describe how the apocalypse happens in my book. Think of the anomalies from Primeval, even though I actually came up with this idea before I ever watched this show, but... In Primeval, there's the anomalies that open and things can come from the past to the present, or vice versa... It's kind of similar to what goes on here, except it's an anomaly that resurrects every extinct animal that ever lived over the period of several years, and it causes, you know, food chains to collapse, and it puts a whole lot of strain on the modern world, and it eventually falls into chaos. That's how it starts, but Spino first appears years before the apocalypse ever even hits. So he was one of, if not the very first, to be resurrected. And... His egg is found by Nick Edwards, who is the main protagonist in the first couple audiobook videos from the story I've put out. If you haven't listened to those, I highly recommend it. Put a lot of effort into them, and they really do introduce the character's setting and plot. But anyway, I'm getting off topic. Spino. 
Uh, now, he is, as I said, he was one of the first resurrected, and he's an example of a variant, which is kind of the way I've come to describe these types of dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals recently. For the most part, you have them resurrected in their paleo-accurate forms, I guess you can say. But there are rare exceptions to this rule, and Spino is one of them. Spino, for example, was altered by the anomaly, and he's a pretty good example. As you know, a normal Spinosaurus has the big eel-like tail, may or may not have walked on all fours, depending on, you know, what year you're looking at a reconstruction from. But Spino stands up upright on his back legs, though he can walk on all fours if he wants, and he doesn't have that eel-like tail, and he's also much bigger than a normal Spinosaurus would be. He's smarter, and he can talk, like any human. And as a result, he is very much a tease. He's very laid back, and as again, he's loyal as the day is long to people he cares about, but he is also an endless tease. But he does know when to draw the line and when to be serious. Uh, as the text right there says, one of his favorite go-to ways to tease people is say, is reminding them that you're a tiny human, I'm a giant dinosaur, I could eat you in one bite. You know, that's, that's kind of his go-to joke. And, um, but yeah. He knows when to draw the line, and he is a force to be reckoned with if his family, his human family, is in danger. Because Nick found his egg, Nick raised him, so he kind of sees Nick as a father and a best friend. Kind of both, not specifically either or. But I never really kind of defined that, but uh, in my mind, they view each other as equals, not as like a father-son relationship. And again, if you want to listen to the audio narration series, the audiobooks are linked below, and you can get a much more in-detail look at that. So anyway, on to the next one. Our next character will be Ness. There she is, okay. Ness uh, is a baryonyx, and in the same boat as Spino. She was altered by the anomaly, and she She's a rare variant, and she can talk. She's smart, and she's bigger than a normal baryonyx. Her real name is actually Nessie, but she only ever mentions this one time in the book, and the rest of it, she just goes by Ness. She never goes by Nessie. And as this says here, she's very, she's a sweetheart, and she, even as an adult, is still young at heart. You know, she's very playful. But she isn't that way throughout the whole book. If you looked at the art, uh, from a, what, a few minutes ago now, you'll notice she kind of is just looking kind of down. That's because she goes through some stuff in this book that really kind of just makes her bubbly personality pop. And she's kind of... Well, at least my dog is interrupting me in a video that's not FNAF for once, so that's something to, to celebrate, I guess. She, she goes through a period where she's more protective of her friend Herschel, and just not as outgoing and playful as she used to be. Uh, what that catalyst for that change is, you will find out uh, when the book comes out. So anyway, next up is someone else who was in the picture. Shadow. Sha I'll be right back. He's not going to stop. All right, now that Tank is out of the house and barking at the squirrels to his little heart's content, I can get back to this. So, Shadow. Shadow is a hybrid dinosaur, as I was saying, and he was created by Ian, who I will get to in time. Ian, it, uh, Ian's like a Frankenstein mad scientist dude who doesn't think ethical laws should have been in place, and he thinks that they really impeded the progress of science, and now in the apocalypse, he doesn't have to follow any laws anymore, and he also has a slew of of new animals to test on and see what they can do, and Shadow is the outcome of that. Shadow is a hybrid, and he can, like Spino, he can walk on his back legs comfortably, or he can drop onto all fours. And the some of the animals that went into Shadow included the Dunkleosteus for the Placoderm armor, and this covers a lot of Shadow's body. He has Stegosaurus Thagomizers on the end of his tail, and he has a Spinosaurus sail on his back. He has Dilophosaurus crests on his head, and there's several other things. If you want to get a better idea, 
I highly re recommend listening to The Hybrid. It's from one of the audiobook narrations. It's linked down there with all the others. And there's a lot going on here that I'm not going to talk about because it would spoil stuff. But Shadow is honestly one of my favorites. And I'm really excited to explore him more in the future. His role in the first book is limited to the second half. So he doesn't get to be in the story as much as characters like Spino and Ness do. But he is one of my favorites and I'm very excited to explore him more in the future. And Shadow can also talk and he's as smart as a human. Just the reason is because Ian wanted to create a hybrid like that so he could... Um, so it could be used, you know, for their own purposes. You know, if it's as smart as a human, think like a human, it can be taught and trained to do things like, you know, someone in the military can. So, yeah. Now we're moving on to version two, literally version two of Shadow. Version two is the direct updated version of Shadow. And unlike Shadow, who was abused to see if that he would submit... That way, they just brainwashed version 2, which is something Ian didn't want to do because Ian wanted more going on inside their hybrids' heads than just tunnel vision caused by brainwashing. Well, for version 2, they brainwashed him, and the result is he has a split personality. His true personality is locked, basically, in his subconscious, and it can only watch as a literal monster controls its own body. The brainwashed personality of version 2 is an extremely sadistic and unstable and aggressive personality. But it's not just all animal instinct. It's still just as smart as a human. It can think things through. It can reason through. And it can, if it wants to stalk someone and scare them and just be a true monster before it goes in for the kill, it will do that. Version 2 is one of my favorite antagonist characters, and he was one of the other ones on the thumbnail. And... When they created version 2, they were obsessed with upping what they did with Shadow in every way. Version 2 is bigger. Version 2 can do things Shadow doesn't. And areas that they thought were mistakes with Shadow, they corrected. He no longer has a crests or a sail. He actually has spikes on his back. He has gills, meaning he can go underwater and he will often stalk and attack like a crocodile. But he's just as lethal on land as he is in the water. Like the others, he can comfortably walk on his hind legs and down on all fours. And uh, I'm right, that's I lost my train of thought for a second there. I'm sorry. Uh, in his mouth, this is something that I got the idea for after seeing a pretty exaggerated but terrifying drawing of an Adestus. An Adestus is a prehistoric shark like fish from about 300 million years ago. And they're called the scissor tooth shark because they had. A single row of teeth, uh, this is a very poor example, but it's the best I can do with my hands. Pretend this is the mouth of a great white shark. Odessus's teeth were like this, right? A very bad example, but you get the idea. And I was like, that's so scary. And I've never seen anyone who creates a hybrid dinosaur give them a single row of teeth in the midline of each jaw like that. So version 2 has Odessus teeth and the Odessus tooth structure. He actually doesn't have a tongue because of that. And he can't even close his mouth all the way. If you want to hear some stuff version 2 is involved with, check out the A Survivor's Daily Routine audiobook trilogy. The others, they're linked below. And I'm actually going to link the play playlist where everything is in chronological order instead of the one where release order, because release order is not in order. <laughs> in the order of the way they occur. But anyway. And then... one Nope. Not Snowflake. She'll be next. Version 3. One of the most mysterious characters in the first book. You don't actually see him. You know he exists, he's mentioned, but he doesn't physically appear. As such, his appearance is going to more or less be saved. However, complete redesign is a hint. And if you go look at the concept art video, you will actually see some art of him. And I will admit, it's very similar to one of the hybrids from one of the, one of the Jurassic World games, but that was not at all intentional. I didn't even know, or it wasn't even one of the games. It was from one of the old toy lines. It wasn't at all intentional. Um, if you know the old toy lines and you see his art, you'll probably be able to figure out which one I'm talking about. 
But I promise that was not intentional. I didn't even see that old toy design until after I'd come up with version 3's design. And but yeah, but they're different enough that I decided I'm not I'm not going to change it. Just like that. So anyway, version 3, very mysterious character. He doesn't appear in either of the two books that are written physically. He's only mentioned, but he will appear eventually. And it'll what side will he be on? Well, you'll have to wait and see. All right, Snowflake is gets her name because she is albino. She's an albino Sukumimus, and she'll be a major character in the future. But for the first book, she's only got a cameo. She only appears in two scenes, very very briefly, and it's to set up her storyline and this going forward. And I even w wasn't originally going to have her appear in the first book, but I was like, I really like this character. I might as well t give a tease for what's to come in the future. And that's the thing. I do a lot of world building and establishing stuff in the first book. And basically, the first book is like part one of a story, and the sequel that I will write in time is part two, and it's going to be one full story. But before I can write a sequel, there's three spinoffs that I need to do first, not only to further the story, but also establish some other stuff that is... Basically, it'll let me keep the, the books themselves from being too bloated. I can tell these other important but more self-contained stories, and then we can get to the actual sequel. So you have the first book, there's going to be three spinoffs, and then there's going to be the sequel, which will not only wrap the first book up, but it's also going to wrap literally everything up. And you have no idea how much stuff that is because you haven't actually seen the books yet, but I can do it. <laughs> I know how to do it, and I, I already have it outlined so but yeah snowflake she got her name because she's albino she's a sukumimus and she's also a variant that can talk is bigger and can, you know you get it by now and um this is something that's going to happen in the future in the sequel one of the things i set up in the first book she she and shadow are soulmates and uh, that's something that's going to really get explored in the next one all right so circling back around to stuff i was talking about at the beginning Nick Edwards. He's the leader of the main community that my book follows. Um, as I say in the description of this video, one of the big inspirations for this was The Walking Dead. Walking Dead is my favorite show. So kind of think how in the later seasons they got a bunch of communities set up. That was one of my idea inspirations and ideas is that there's different communities of people around and Nick leads one that is in a housing development that had just finished construction right when everything fell apart so no one had ever lived there and they have a self-sustaining system so they still have running water and they're living the good life in the apocalypse and Nick basically the first two audiobook parts are actually from his perspective because that part of the book is written like it's Nick's journal and then after that we get to third person where Nick is just one of the many characters we're following because at the end of the day, it's not Nick's story. He's just a character. He He's just someone else who's in it. You know, the these books follow a lot of characters. And it doesn't ever put the focus solely on one. Some of the spinoffs will take the time to do that. But the main books themselves follow a lot of characters. And it's never one specific character's story. Though Spino, as the mascot character, is kind of the main overall character throughout the story. Nick cares a lot about his the community he oversees. He came into leading them during the conflict very early in the apocalypse. Again, this is the audiobook stuff. This is all here. And he feels pressured to do extra things around the community just to, you know, just to... He, stuff he doesn't have to do, you know, but stuff that he does do, and it adds a lot of stress to his plate. And at the same time, he's also trying to raise a family. So Nick is, he's got, he's doing a lot and he's just trying to manage it the best he can because he was a college age student whenever things fell apart. You know, the main books is set a decade later, but, you know, and he was getting a degree in animal biology and then all this happens. So yeah, it's, it's a lot and uh, it's not the kind of thing he ever was prepared to deal with, but now he has to deal with. So, and Nick is one of those characters who kind of, is the embodiment of one of the characters from After They Awoke I mentioned. The main character of After They Awoke is very similar to Nick, though that character was a little bit younger. After They Awoke was more about um, four cousins who were teenagers 
who kind of have to adapt to this new apocalypse, right, as they're all about to become adults. But that's not what the Spinal Source is about. So anyway, this is Nick's wife. Um, you can pause and read this or just go watch the character intro video. This video is already getting really long, so I'm kind of going to speed run. I'm only going to hit the big ones. So Susan, very major character. And um, yeah, she's a, she's a really big character. Uh, she does a lot throughout the story. She's oh, She never gets to like... She's a supporting character throughout the whole story. She's kind of always there. And um, Nick and Mabel, I'd say, are more crucial to the plot than she is. But she she has her moments, and she she influences things and plays a big role throughout. So Susan is a... Out of all the supporting characters, she's definitely one of the most important ones. Mabel is Nick and Susan's daughter. And she is probably the second biggest character in the book after Spino. Um, Mabel is... Um, a kid who was born into this apocalypse. She never knew a world without dinosaurs and prehistoric life running around. So, it, very similar to Mai Wokowski, actually. Um, they, they're both, you know, kids who were born into this world, and they never knew it without dinosaurs. So, you know, there's obviously things that their parents, you know, experience that they never will. And uh, she and Spinal are very close. They are very much best friends. Completely minor character I don't really need to talk about. Uh, Steve, very big character. He's Nick's right-hand man. And basically all the information you really need to know about him going into this is right here. He blames himself for the death of his family at the start of the apocalypse. And he's working to better himself in the vain hope that if any of his family are still out there, he can have a second chance with them. So that's kind of his main motivation throughout the story. And if you want to get to know him a little bit better, you can... Check out the audio stuff. Okay, these are all really minor characters who I'm... Well, they're well. some of them are more important than others, like Arnold and Max. Those are pretty important characters. But I'm only going to really hit the main, main, main ones. So those are still supporting characters. So Carl Newton, one of the... I'd say antagonists with the biggest impact in the story. Carl is a serial killer. And he's a very smart serial killer. And he likes playing mind games with people and having... Basically, the chessboard playing out the way he wants it. You know, he likes it when he can control what everyone else is going to do and he knows how a situation is going to play out. And he will take all the time he needs to make a plan go down and the way he wants. He's very sadistic and he gets his rocks off to torturing people, basically. Basically showing his power that he's more powerful than them. That's, that's what he gets off to, basically. And in the apocalypse, he's the head of a military unit you know, for a community, so very easy to abuse that power, and he does. And basically, Carl leads this military unit for his community, which were originally just called the Patriots, because, you know, we're going to we're gonna bounce back, we're going to rebuild. He renamed them to the Patriot States of America, even though it's just one city, because Patriots alone didn't fit his ego. He has a massive ego, and he never shuts up either. He He's one of those antagonists that you hate, like, in a story. Like, he's one of those ones who you're just like, oh my gosh, this guy makes my blood boil, and you just cannot wait to see them get their comeuppance. You know the type. You've seen movies, I'm sure. <laughs> so, yeah, Carl, and he leads his people out. They find smaller communities. They take them over, and then they will thank the aliens from Independence Day. This was kind of a big inspiration. They slowly will sap every natural resource or every resource from this community they find, and then once there's nothing, and, you know, distribute it to their own, and then when there's nothing left, they just wipe everybody out and move on, so. Yeah, and there would be groups like that in the apocalypse, which was what made me decide to go for it, so yeah. Jeffrey, minor character. Ian, I kind of already talked about him, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip him. If you want to read all this, you can pause it. Miller, another minor character, um, well, he's kind of important, but he's not, he doesn't have a very big present in the book, and you hear about him way before you actually see him. If you want to, just pause, if any of these characters that I'm not going to talk about you're interested in, just, just pause and read it, I'll give you a second. Okay, Herschel's a pretty major supporting character. He's one of the human survivors of the apocalypse, and he meet, when after he and Ness join the community, uh, they don't quite get a help out whenever they try to fight back against Carl and the Patriots because they get captured by the Patriots. And 
because of that, Herschel has this feeling that he needs to prove himself to the community, you know? And this kind of comes up later. He feels like he has something to prove because he wasn't there to help them fight in this brutal, bloody conflict that, you know, nearly saw them all get wiped out. So, you know, kind of like Nick, he feels like he has something to prove when he really doesn't. Okay, Dylan is a very important character in the second half of the book. He is... Now, obviously, uh, hang on. Now, if you read this, it's pretty obvious there's a time skip at some point. And yes, the book has two time skips. One, the first half is set 11 years in the apocalypse. The second half is set 21 years into the apocalypse. Dylan is 10 years old during, 10 or 11 years old, somewhere right around there. Whenever uh, the war with Carl is going on with the main group. And um, in the second half, he is now a Patriot military recruit. And he comes across Shadow, and that leads him into discovering there's a conspiracy going on. And if you want to get a tease as to that storyline, check out the hybrid uh, audiobook narration. Amelia, pretty minor character, so I'm, I'm going to skip over her. Tim, uh, he, his, his biggest contribution is that he helps create the hybrids, and he's an unwitting pawn in the... Uh, plans of the extremist group. Adam Wolkowski, really, really big character, but basically everything you need to know about him is right here, so just, just pause and read it, and yeah. And if you have any questions about any of these characters, uh, please ask them, and I will be happy to answer them, because obviously this video is over 23 minutes now, and I don't want this to be an hour-long video of me just talking about walls of text, so <laughs> let's keep going. If you want to get to know Adam, and basically the entire Wachowski family, check out uh, the uh, Survivor's Daily Routine trilogy. They're the main characters of those narrations. So, we have Adam. We have his wife, Kalani. Um, out of all the Wachowski characters, she's probably the least impactful in the plot, but she's still a major character. And, you know, she, she basically will do anything for her kids. And her worst fear is something happening to her kids. And, and um, so yeah. Um, let's see, who's next? I think it's Katrina. Is it Katrina? I think it's Katrina. Oh, it's Nolan. Nolan is the oldest Wachowski, and he's a level-headed kid. He's smart, and he's capable, but he tends... He gets scared very, very easily. And, you know, there he always comes through in the end, but, you know... One of the big things is, you know, he always comes through for his family, no matter how scary a situation might be. But, you know, is there ever a time whenever he won't and he'll just panic and run? You know, that's kind of a thing that's going on with him. So, Katrina Wachowski, just pause and read because this is a lot. She's got a lot going on with her. And she and Adam have a very strained relationship. That's something that you do need to know. Because Adam is constantly working with his son, Nolan, to help teach him how to survive in the world. And Katrina thinks that Adam just doesn't think she's capable. Or even when, even though this shocks her mother. And she even thinks he might be sexist. He's not. It, they have a massive communication error. And it's caused their relationship to be majorly strained. So. Maeve Wachowski. Perhaps, I'd say the second most important Wachowski out of them all. She's the youngest. And like I mentioned she's a kid. Who grew up in this world. And she constantly forgets how dangerous it is, especially because um, three oversized talking raptors who she's secretly friends with keep the area around the Wachowski house safe. And so she doesn't run into dangers like others might. And those raptors are Streak, his brother Bard, and Gamma. Gamma's the only one who's not related. Yeah, there are three raptors in a pack, and I absolutely love these three. They're some of my favorites. And just I'm just going to let you pause and read about them. If you want to get to know them, or at least get introduced to them, check out the same trilogy, the Survivor's Daily Routine one. Bard, I absolutely adore, because one of my favorite lines he ever says is, because Streak is very serious and no-nonsense, and, uh, want, and um, Bard is basically, no, I'm just cocky as all. I love it. I love him, and he's awesome. I love he's very laid back. And then Gamma, is personality-wise, is the middle man between the two. Or, as I wrote here, the middle raptor. And out of the three oversized raptors, Gamma is actually the only one 
to have any feathers. Because one of the things that happens with the anomaly is that sometimes talking ones don't have feathers. Feathered variants do exist, but they're even rarer than the already rare talking ones. So, Gamma is an ultra rare raptor. And he, Streak, and Bard are all velociraptors, but again, the anomaly oversizes every single one that it changes and gives the ability to speak to. They are ba they are about as big as Utah raptors. They're massive. They're they're big. <laughs> they they got a major size upgrade compared to a normal velociraptor. You know, a little cute feathered fella. No, these guys are forces of nature. They're and uh, I just love the way they play off each other. Alma, very minor character in the first book. Um, she's only introduced and one of and she's only introduced in the first book. She'll be a major character later on in one of the spinoffs, so I'm going to go ahead and go past her. Same thing with June, except she'll actually be in the sequel. Uh, June, very minor character. And like many other of our talking dinosaur friends, she is a tease. That, that's something that is in co that's very common throughout. They're, they're, a lot of them tend to be teases, and a lot of them don't tend to filter a lot of things. Like, they'll just speak their mind because they don't have, like, the awkwardness that, like, humans do with certain things. So... The talking dinosaurs generally will speak their mind, and they will use that in a tease, and it can sometimes make their human friends uncomfortable. It's just kind of a funny thing to play off of. Flash, very, very minor character in the first book, just a cameo, uh, but he'll be a big character in the sequel. He is a talking Utah raptor, and he has feathers, so he's an ultra rare. He is an ultra rare. Alma also has feathers. June does not. Alma is a feathered tyrannosaur, and June isn't. And there's also another name, unnamed talking feathered tyrannosaurus on the first book too. Diamond, um, I'm just going to let you read another minor character in the first book who will be way more important in the sequel than she is in the first one. A lot of these characters are just introduced in the first book. Thomas Rees, not even mentioned in the first book, he's just mentioned by name once. And Thomas Rees is going to be the main antagonist of one of the spinoffs. And I haven't quite decided yet, but I think his cult is going to be the big bad of the sequel, too. I haven't quite decided. I was originally going to have another group show up, but I think it would be better to have this this group, based on what I'm going to do in one of the spinoffs. So we'll probably see these guys be more important than I originally intended. But basically, Thomas Rees leads the, I'm going to butcher this Spanish probably, Cuatro Brazos Cartel, which he's named because they his cult worships a four-armed spirit. And he made this religion up as a way of getting people to follow him and to just do what he says. Because he wanted, and he's from Central America, and he wanted to create a drug trafficking cartel that would basically control all of the trafficking in the region. And at the point, it's gotten to the point where he now believes his own lies, and he believes that he is a, basically nothing short of a god in flesh, and his cult is one of the ways they'll get their four-armed spirit to come to them is human sacrifice. So, apocalypse, deranged cult, human sacrifice, yeah, they're not a good people to encounter. And uh, as I said, <clears throat> as I say at the bottom here too, only mentioned by name in the first book, he will appear in the spinoff as an antagonist, and I think his group will appear in the sequel again, so this group is gonna, probably going to be a pretty important one. Uh, the raptor mammal hybrids, this is going to be something that I'm setting up for way later on. They get an indirect mention in the first book, that's it. If you want to read this wall of text, pause it. Basically, after I finish the main story, my plan is to go back and actually finish after they awoke, and then if I want to carry on with this universe after that, I'm going to write a spin-off series, a brand new story set in Europe, and that's where these guys are. And I set them in Europe so I can keep them away from the main characters because these things are ridiculously dangerous. And basically, Apocalypse in Europe is on, you know, nightmare difficulty, while Apocalypse in America is just on like normal. <laughs> you know, th not a good comparison, but you you get the idea. If this if there was a video game, Apocalypse in Europe is way harder because of these guys right here. So. Yeah, so, and because they have no natural predators, I think I mentioned this. Uh, probably. I do think I mentioned, but because they have no natural predators, they spread very, 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 yeah, yeah, without any natural predators. So yeah, just pause and read this if you want to hear more about them.
And I do believe that is the last one. So anyway, that was a little bit of a breakdown of some of the characters and just what you can expect. I hit on some things that I didn't quite get to in this particular video here. So yeah, I do hope that um, this all sounds interesting to you. And, you know, I put a lot of work the last two years into the into these first two books because I ended up writing them at the same time, more or less. And uh, hopefully it won't be too much longer before the first one comes out. Maybe next summer. That'd be nice. I do. Th maybe this first one will come out next summer. I was hoping to have it out this year. But, you know, real real life stuff gets in the way sometimes. So it's going to be pushed back a little bit. But it's going to happen. And I'm really excited. I've wanted to be an author basically my whole life. And, you know, I tried, tried with After They Awoke, but I never finished it. But this is going to be the first one that I actually seriously will and i'm gonna you know stick with and not finishing after they awoke has kind of bothered me but i did move on from that and i do want to go back and finish it but the reason i didn't is because i would basically need to rewrite the whole thing because i know that it's in a bit of a it's in a very rough state so anyway and i wrote that one thinking that it would be my series so there were setups and stuff for sequels that I've already decided I'm not going to do. When I go back and redo After They Awoke, it's going to just be one and done. But this story is going to... There's, a, I'm playing the Spinosaurus, and there's going to be the Spinosaurus, basically, part. That's not what it's going to be called. It's going to have a name. Then there's the spinoffs. It's going to be a complete story, you know? This is going to be a multi-part complete story. And, uh, yeah. I'm very excited for it. I'm very passionate about it. And the, these characters started off as just ideas and you know they they mean the world to me now and i absolutely just love this story and the world i'm very proud of it and i'm very proud of the world i've created and i can't wait to share it with everyone so thank you all for watching i hope you enjoyed listening to me ramble for like 30 minutes if you want to hear me ramble for like 30 minutes in another video i don't know go check out my the story of my canceled fnaf fan game video and check out the audiobook stuff that's linked below and just some other stuff that's linked below. So thank you all for watching. If you're at all curious to hear more about this, please consider subscribing and sticking around. Or just check back in maybe around December because I'm planning to do like a proper update of the situation around then. So thank you all for watching and I will see you in the next video.